Greetings. Warm Advent blessings to all of you, my dear sisters and brothers, and my dear friends, and all are welcome. We're stepping in the fourth week, and this week is a theme of a time to love in our fourth Sunday of Advent. I'm going to talk about the birth of Jesus in Matthew 1, the verses 18 to 25. This was how the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place. His mother, Mary, was engaged to Joseph, but before they came together, she turned out to be pregnant. pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her husband-to-be, was an upright man. He didn't want to make a public example of her, so he decided to set the marriage aside privately. But while he was considering this, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, don't be afraid to get married to Mary. The child she is carrying is from the Holy Spirit. She is going to have a son. You must give him the name Jesus. He is the one who will save his people from their sins. All this happened so that what the Lord said through the prophet might be fulfilled. Look, the virgin is pregnant and will have a son, and they shall give him the name Emmanuel, which means in translation, God with us. When Joseph woke up from his sleep, he did what the Lord's angel had told him to. He married his wife, but he didn't have sexual relations with her until after the birth of her son, and he gave him the name Jesus. One of the most memorable movies I have seen is the film of the Charles Dickens novel, Little Dorrit. It is actually two films, both very long. The two films don't follow in sequence, telling the first and second half of the story. Instead, each film shows the whole drama, but from a different point of view. First we see the action through the eyes of the hero, then in the second film, the second story through the eyes of the heroine. A few scenes are identical, but in the second film we understand many things that hadn't been clear first time around. Like seeing with two eyes instead of one. The double movie enables the viewer to get a sense of death. And perspective on the whole dramatic story. The story of Jesus' birth in Matthew's Gospel is seen through the eyes of Joseph. In Luke's Gospel, we see it through Mary's. No attempt is made to bring them into line. The central fact is the same, but instead of Luke's picture of an excited Galilean girl, learning that she is to give birth to God's Messiah. Matthew shows, shows us more, the more sober Joseph, discovering that his fiancée is pregnant. The only point where the two stories come close is when the angel says to Joseph, as Gabriel said to Mary, don't be afraid. That is an important word for us, too, as we read the accounts of Jesus' birth. Fear at this point is normal. For centuries now, many opponents of Christianity and many devout Christians themselves have felt that these stories are 
embarrassing and unnecessary and untrue. We know many will say that miracles don't happen. Remarkable healings, perhaps there are ways of explaining them. But not babies born without human fathers. This is straining things too far. Some got further. These stories, they say, have had an unfortunate effect. They have given the impression that sex is dirty and that God doesn't want anything to do with it. They have given rise to the legend that Mary stays a virgin forever, something the Bible never says. Indeed, here and elsewhere, it implies that she and Joseph lived a normal married life after Jesus' birth. This has promoted the belief that the virginity is better than marriage, and so on. Let me give you this translation. In the Hebrew, the word virgin, translated to English, is young woman. It is, of course, true that strange ideas have grown up around the story of Jesus' conception and birth. But Matthew and Luke can hardly be blamed for that. They were telling the story they believed was both true and the ultimate explanation of why Jesus was the person he was. They must have known that they were taking a risk in the ancient pagan world There were plenty of stories of heroes conceived by the intervention of a god without the human father. And surely Matthew was his very Jewish perspective and everything would hardly invent such a thing or copy it from someone else unless he really believed it. Wouldn't it be opening Christianity to the sneers of its opponents? who would quickly suggest the obvious alternative, namely that Mary had become pregnant through some more obvious but less reputable means. Oh yes, it would, but that would only be relevant if nobody already knew that there had been something strange about Jesus' conception. In John's Gospel, we hear the echo of a taunt made during Jesus' lifetime. Maybe, the crowd suggests, Jesus' mother had been misbehaving before her marriage. Chapter 8, 41 It looks as though Matthew and Luke are telling this story because they know rumors have circulated and they want to set the record straight. Alternatively, people have suggested that Matthew made the story up so that it would present a fulfillment of the passage he quotes in verse 23 from Isaiah 7.14. But interestingly, there is no evidence that anyone before Matthew saw that verse as something that would have to be fulfilled by the coming Messiah. It looks rather as though he found the verse because he already knew the story. Not the other way around. Everything depends, of course, on whether you believe that the living God could or would act like that. Some say he couldn't, miracles don't happen. Others that he wouldn't, if he did that, why doesn't he intervene to stop genocide? Some say Joseph and others at the time didn't know the scientific laws of nature the way we do. And though this story gives the lie to that, since if Jesus, I mean, if Joseph hadn't known how babies were normally made, he wouldn't have had a problem with Mary's unexpected pregnancy. But Matthew and Luke don't ask us to take the story all by itself. 
They ask us to see it in the light both of the entire history of Israel, in which God's love was always present and at work, often in very surprising ways, and more particularly of the subsequent subsequent story of Jesus himself. Thus the rest of the story and the impact of Jesus on the world and countless individuals within it ever since make it more or less likely that he was indeed conceived by a special act of the Holy Spirit? That is a question everyone must answer for themselves. But Matthew wouldn't want us to stop there. He wants to tell us more about who Jesus was and is in a time-honored Jewish fashion by special names. The name Jesus was a popular boy's name at the time, being in Hebrew the same as Joshua, who brought the Israelites into the Promised Land after the death of Moses. Matthew sees Jesus as the one who will now complete what the law of Moses pointed to, both but could not of itself produce. He will rescue his people not from slavery in Egypt, but from the slavery of sin. The exile they have suffered not just in Babylon, but in their own hearts and lives. By contrast, the name Emmanuel mentioned in Isaiah 7:14 and 8:8 8, 8, was not given to anyone else, perhaps because it would say more about the child than anyone would normally dare. It means God with us. Matthew's whole gospel is framed by this theme at the very end. Jesus promises that he will be with his people to the close of the age. 28 verse 20. The two names together express the meaning of the story. God is present with his people. He doesn't intervene from a distance, but is always active, expressing his love in unexpected ways, and God's actions are aimed at rescuing people from a helpless plight, demanding that he take the initiative and do things people had regarded as, so to speak, inconceivable. This is the God, and this is the Jesus, whose boundless love for the world is expressed in the story that Matthew sets before us. Reflect on this, my dear ones. What do you believe about Jesus' conception and why? How does this passage help you? This is your passion, Yadid.